Hi there. Welcome back again to the Ivory Tower Collections. And yes, yes, I know. It's another Atari 5200. What's up with that? Well, honestly, this video was supposed to be about something else related to the Atari 5200. And in the process of going through that video, I discovered something else that I thought was far more interesting. And that's what we're going to cover in this video today. So what was the specific issue? Well, this is a 5200 that I had already fixed once before in a previous video. It's the one that had the audio issues that I had to resolve. Well, while working on it earlier today, I discovered another issue that I was not aware of that it has. Specifically, I found out that the top controller buttons didn't work on this test controller of mine. Now, yes, I know this test controller obviously looks like a test controller. It's missing the set of buttons at the top here but it does function otherwise. And uh, in fact, uh, it was working previously on another 5200 that I had used it with for testing. So I was surprised when I discovered that the uh, upper top set of buttons, fire buttons, wasn't working anymore. And I wanted to get to the root of that and try to find out what was going on. To be honest, I initially thought the problem was the, probably the controller, and we'll get to that. So, Here's the process I had to go through, and that's what this video will discuss, is the process of the troubleshooting I went through to fix the issue with the top fire button not functioning. There's going to be quite a few additional tools used in this video that I've not really used previously, but I do use them in a lot of my projects, so hopefully you'll find that interesting. Kick back and enjoy. So the first thing I want to talk about is a quick and easy way to test the controller itself without even having to take it apart to be able to verify if the issue with the fire buttons not working is actually an issue within the controller itself, which would usually be the Mylar flex circuit, similar to what you see up here, or if it's something else. So that's what I wanted to do first. Since I already had a pretty good idea that the controller wasn't at fault, I wanted to verify this. And the easiest way to do that actually involves a couple of handy tools. What I would recommend you to use is, first of all, you'll need to use a multimeter set in resistance mode. And in this particular case, we're gonna use my California Instruments Nixie tube uh, multimeter that I have here. And then the other thing I would recommend is probably you'll want to have like some safety pins or possibly some small needles that you can actually insert into the female connector end on the controller cable itself here. Now, what I'm actually going to be using is a couple of uh, fairly large leads that were cut from some components, from probably from some larger capacitors or something. So the leads are fairly thick. They're thick enough that they fit just about perfectly in the holes here. And I'm gonna show you how to easily check the fire button functionality without even taking apart the controller. Here's what you do. So using a pen, or a needle, or in this case, my leads that I have cut here. I'm gonna take one of them and I'm gonna put it into pin 15 on the connector here. And I'll, I'll put a little graphic or something over here while I'm doing this. So I'm putting one of my connectors or one of my probes into uh, pin 15, and the other one I'm gonna put into pin 13, or the opening for pin 13. Now that's gonna to be to check the bottom fire button operation right here. Now what I'm going to be looking for is if the buttons are working properly, then take a look at the uh, numbers here on my uh, multimeter. So when I push the button, we'll see my numbers drop down to virtually zero. So here I go. I'm getting ready to push the bottom fire button now. And you can see that it dropped all the way down to a zero. Well, 0 0.01, but I think that's the lowest that this meter, this old meter goes. And I'm doing it on both sides. I already know that because the uh, resistance, or basically because it shows closed on the meter here, I know that that button is registering properly all the way from here to the cable end properly. 
Now, if I move the probe from pin 13 over to pin 14, right next to where pin 15 is, that's actually to check the top set of fire buttons. So I'm gonna push those now, and we'll, if you take a look at the numbers, we'll see the exact same thing. There's that one, and I'll push the top button on the other side. There we go. Okay. So already, just from this one little simple test of just connecting up some uh, probes from a multimeter into pins 15 and then 13 or 14 on the connector end of the controller, you can quickly and easily verify if the issue is the controller or something else. So you don't also have to use resistance mode. You could also use a normal digital multimeter and put it in continuity mode. So I'll do that right now. Let me take my probes from off of here and I'll put them into my multimeter, my other multimeter. And I'm going to put this into just continuity mode, just like that. Now, we'll do the same test again. If everything is working properly, let's see, I currently have it in uh, checking 13 and 15. It should complete the circuit when I push the buttons and we should hear it beep. There we go, there's one, and there's the other. Do the same thing, I'll move it over from 13 over to 14 on the connector side. Whoops, touched it a little bit. Let me move my uh, alligator clips up there just a little bit. There we go. And if I push the top buttons, we should get continuity again. And the other one. There we go. So, again, good easy way to test if you have an issue with the controller side or somewhere else. So obviously we know that this controller is good to go. Now we need to do some further troubleshooting to find out why the top set of fire buttons aren't registering on this 5200. So here we are looking at the 5200 again and I've actually got my Pete's test cartridge installed in here right now. Um, you can get these cartridges from Atari Age. It's a very handy cartridge to use for calibration, uh, mainly for testing controller functionality, which is what I was using it for in this particular instance. We're also going to use the uh, Atari Diagnostics uh, version 1.1 diagnostic ROM as well later on, possibly to troubleshoot. But for now, we're going to start with Pete's test cartridge, and I'll show you uh, basically how this works. So again, this 5200 appears to be functioning normally. It goes through a quick self-test, and then it takes us to this little screen here where I have the cursor I can move around. Not sure how well that will show up in the video, but you have to trust me, it's there. Now normally when you push the bottom fire button, it'll switch between a couple of different screens, like there's the color bars, there's a gray bars test, which is also doing audio, which if I move the controller around, will change the amplitude or volume, as well as the pitch. As you can see here. Okay, well, the top fire button is supposed to activate the controller reading and calibration screen, and that's not happening. You can see I am pushing these top buttons, and nothing is happening. It does nothing, and that's where the problem lies. But again, we've already checked the controller itself, so we know that there's nothing actually wrong with the controller. It's got to be something else with the 5200. So to troubleshoot this issue, we actually need to refer to the service manual. So uh, I'll probably uh, put some little descriptions or some graphs or something up here. But specifically, what we'll need to look at is we'll need to look at the troubleshooting flowchart in the service manual starting on 4-20. And by the way, this is version 4 of the service manual that I'll be looking at. You can actually download that uh, service manual from Console5's Tech Wiki. I'll put a link to it. Uh, in the video description down below. First of all, you got to be familiar with Atari's terminology on this. They refer to the top fire button as the soft fire. Don't know why, but they call it the soft fire. So in the troubleshooting section for that, that's what you'll need to look for is a section that says soft fire, top fire button troubleshooting. And again, in the version four of the service manual, this begins in 4-20. And the, uh, I'll, I'll put like a small graph of the uh, flowchart probably over here on the side somewhere, but uh, it probably won't all fit. 
So I'll read to you what it says. First of all, of course, it says to insert a diagnostic cartridge and go into the controller test mode. Now what they want you to do is, is with the controller plugged in and with it in the controller test mode, the first thing we need to do is to verify for the presence of five volts peak to peak waveforms on chip number U13 on pins one, two, four, and five. Well, what are they talking about? Let me show you. Okay. We're now looking at a portion of the Atari 5200 mainboard itself. And the specific chip that we need to focus on as part of the troubleshooting is right here. Now it actually says up above it on the silk screen, it actually says U13 up above it. Now on some of the newer motherboards, they've actually changed the letter U's to letter A's, but they basically say the same thing. So if it was a newer board, it might say A13 instead of U13. But in this case, this is an older four port and it does have the U's marking all the chip locations. So we need to look at U13 right here. Now, this chip happens to be a 4052, uh, like a, a multiplexer. And there are quite a few of them on the 5200, as you can see here. It's got like, a, what, like five of them here, I believe. And they are in charge of controlling all of the functionality from the four controller ports of knowing which button key combinations are doing what. And then they relay all that information back to this chip here called the Pokey chip. The Pokey chip is in charge of handling all of the uh, uh, controls as well as the audio for the 5200. So again, they want us to check some readings specifically from this chip here. So how are we going to do that? Well, specifically what they stated was is they said that we need to check for the presence of a five volt peak to peak signal coming off of some of the pins from this chip. Anytime you see something that talks about a five volt peak to peak or P2P as it was listed in the documents, they are talking about the use of an oscilloscope or a scope of some sort to be able to actually see the quick pulse frequency signals that take place within an IC chip. I'll have to change my angle over here in a second to show over on the oscilloscope reading so that you'll get an idea as to what we're looking at. But here's what we need to do. So first of all, I have to get my oscilloscope probe and I have to have my oscilloscope turned on physically, which it is. Since we're needing to look for five volts peak to peak, I'm going to set the variable voltage rate or the vari variable voltage scale on my um, oscilloscope to one volt per division. And then uh, the variable time, I'm not sure what that will need to be at just yet, but I will usually try to match that up. Like for instance, if we need to look for five volts peak to peak, then I'll just start off with like five, uh, I'll just start with like five milliseconds starting off. I need to make sure that I have my uh, oscilloscope to read DC signals here. And then I have the probe here. Now I'll do this again separately so that you'll be able to see it. Now, before you do anything else and touch any of the chips on this board, Keep in mind, the 5200 has to be powered on while you do this. As such, you have to be very careful not to short anything when testing anything with your probes. Additionally, these chips right here that we're talking about, they're very prone to static damage or static discharge, also known as ESD. As such, make sure you're wearing a wrist strap and grounded properly to the console and the console's grounded properly as well. This way, everything is at the same potential and you should be able to protect yourself and the electronics in the process of testing. So, I need to go ahead and I need to check for the presence of those five volt peak to peak signals on pins one, two, four, and five on this tiny little IC. So the first thing I need to do is I need to ground my probe. So I'm just gonna choose one of these uh, capacitors here off of one of the ports that are, because the other ends of them are tied to this large ground plane right here, so that's a perfect place to go. And then I'm just gonna get my probe here, and the first thing I'll do is I'll check for that five volt signal on pin one. So I'm just gonna take my probe and just kinda hold it down here on pin one real quick and see if I'm getting anything. And I don't see anything happening at all. Obviously I can push the buttons and make things happen on the screen still, but I don't see anything happening on my oscilloscope. It is completely dead on pin one. Let me put it on pin two and same results. I get nothing at all. It is dead as a doornail. Put it on pin four and still nothing. Well, actually I take that back. I have a very tiny reading of something, but 
I actually have my volts now set to 0.1 volts per division and I'm only getting 0.1 volts. So I am not reading what I should be reading. Remember, they said we should look for the presence of five volts peak to peak. And then the last pin to check is pin five. And that is also not giving me any readings whatsoever. So what do we do? Well, let's see what the troubleshooting guide flow step says to do next on this. So according to the troubleshooting flow chart, if we are not getting the five volts peak to peak on those pins that we just measured, then the next step is to check for the presence of a five volt peak to peak waveform on that same chip at pins nine and 10. So once again, I'm gonna get the probe here, make sure that my ground doesn't come loose here as it wants to try to do. And this time I need to check pins nine and 10. Now, I didn't state it before, but the way the pins are numbered on this particular IC is the one in the very lower left-hand corner here is actually pin one, and then it goes two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And then starting at the upper right is where you go nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So it's a 16 pin IC chip. So again, we need to check for the five volt waveforms on pins nine and 10. So I'll start with the one on the very end here, which is pin nine. And that seems to be getting me something. I need to reduce this down. Oh yes. Let me go back to one volt per division. And I do have a square wave. Now, in order to see actual square wave square waves, I have to drop it down to about 20 milliseconds on the time. And it's not, uh, it's not a steady picture. It kind of flickers, but it's there. But I definitely have a five volt peak to peak reading on pin nine. Now I'm gonna check pin 10. And yes, that one's actually a little bit quicker. So I'm setting it at 10 milliseconds per division on time, but I am reading a five volt peak to peak on pin nine and 10. So with that in mind, what do we do next? It says, if that's a yes, it says to replace U13, boom. So right there, the flow chart's telling me that if I have no voltage, or if I am not getting five volts peak to peak on pins one, two, four, and five, but I am getting five volts peak to peak readings on my oscilloscope on pins nine and 10, then that means there's something wrong with U13. It's not doing its job, change it out. So that's what we're gonna do next. Here we are once again, looking at the uh, 4052 chip right here. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that the 5200 is powered off, which it is. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull this chip and replace it. Now, I wanna be honest with you, I already troubleshot this once before and had fixed it. This chip was not in a socket originally. I installed the socket. Anytime I find a bad IC chip that I have to replace, I always try to find a socket to install for easier replacement in the future. So I had already done that part. Here is a replacement, 4052. MUX controller chip, as I call them for short. And uh, it's even another RCA brand, just like the originals. So I'm gonna get that popped in here. There we go. And then uh, I'll go ahead and turn the 5200 back on again. And Pete's test cart came up just fine. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna switch back over to the oscilloscope again, and I'm going to now diagnose and check those pins per the flow chart to see if we're getting the right readings that we expect. We're looking at my oscilloscope again, and right now I have my probe attached to the calibration point, which is why I'm reading my uh, 0.5 volt peak to peak square wave. This is my normal test. So I'll go ahead and disconnect the probe, and uh, we will reattach it back to the 5200 and check those points again. Let me reduce it back down to one volt per division. Drop my zero line down here a bit so we'll be able to see it. And let me try changing the time. So the first thing we wanna do is check for the presence of that five volts peak to peak off of pins one, two, four, and five. 
So let's check pin one first. Oh, there we go. The uh, auto triggering was messing with us there. And there we are. Let me drop that down a little bit. So that is the reading from pin one. So that's pretty close there. That's uh, We're seeing something there for sure. More than we were before. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was actually two volts per division. Now I'm at one volt per division. That looks a little better. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to make out, but uh, we are basically reading a... Uh, see if I can make that a little steadier. Basically right about there. So it's going to be hard to tell, but I see basically a square wave or a waveform on here that's reading 5 volts peak to peak. That's pin 1. Now we're going to check pin 2. Getting roughly the same thing there, so that's good. And then we're going to go to check pin 4. Also getting a 5 volt peak to peak waveform there as well. And finally check 5. And five is going to be real hard to tell, but there is a five volt peak there at the very top there in the thin. And the little mountains kind of like right up there. But it is there. <laughs> cool. So that seems normal. Now, there are further troubleshooting steps to go through that it is, that is outlined in the uh, documents. You know, as an example, if you are reading the uh, five volts peak to peak waveforms on one, two, four, and five, then what they want you to do is they want you to press and hold the soft fire button uh, and check pin 3 to see if pin 3 is actually pulsing when you do that. And uh, I will try my best to replicate this. I already have a pretty good idea that we're good to go at this point, but you know, we're going to go ahead and check this out just to be sure. Now remember, we've been skipping pin 3 prior to this. So now we're going to be on pin 3 here. So we're now on pin 3. And if I hold down the soft fire, it should do what they say. It should say that it's pulsing. So I'm going to raise this waveform up a little bit. And there we go. And as I push that fire button, we can see, and this is the top fire button I'm pushing, we can see that there's a, a, a new fall to the rise of the waveform. So it is pulsing and indicating that that is working properly. So if that is a yes condition, and it is, then in that point, if there's still problems with the controller, then they want us to start swapping out some of the main larger IC chips on the board. But luckily, I didn't have to go that far. So I will show you what we see on the screen now. So here we are. I've got Pete's test cart running again. We've got uh, U13 changed out on the board here. Still got my wrist strap on just in case. And uh, we've got the uh, calibration window up here, the little uh, dot and square. And again, if I use the bottom fire button, there we go, it'll scroll through the different screens. Just like we expect. And now when I push one of the top fire buttons, we now get the controller reading and calibration screen. Excellent. Pushing that just flip-flops back and forth between it. But now I know that the top soft fire or top fire button is working again. And again, this is an interesting challenge and an interesting issue because what you might initially think is a fault with the controller itself, especially given the fact that these controllers are notorious for having problems, especially the flex circuits breaking often, uh, you'd be surprised. Sometimes do a little bit of extra troubleshooting to validate that the controller is at fault first and if it's not at fault, then it's time to start taking a look at the service guide and start taking a look at the deep insides of your 5200 itself. So this was a pretty cool one. I had a lot of fun doing this one today. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as well. You got to see me use my scope to its actual intended purpose that I have it for. And you also got to see my uh, California Instruments multimeter for once, which I don't normally show it too often, but I do use it for checking uh, resistance readings, and sometimes I use it for actually checking voltages as well. It's handy to have it on the bench. So uh, once again, thanks for hanging out with me today at the Ivory Tower, and uh, 
Be sure to like and subscribe if you check if you like this video, or let me know down below in the comments what you didn't like or what I should improve on. I'll catch you guys next time. Thanks.